Do I need to hold this? Yes, okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for hanging in there. I was here yesterday, and uh, I, each one of these programs and panels and discussions and presentations have been just tremendous. And uh, I hope that uh, we can count on your uh, attention uh, as we move to the home stretch. Um, I am very honored uh, to, be, to have been asked to moderate this panel uh, and honored to be partnering with uh, Aleph on so many different uh, projects. Um, uh, I have the good fortune to have two extraordinary uh, panelists uh, and uh, two people who are eminently well qualified to talk about mercy and dignity. I can't help but reflect that if I had been doing a program like this 15 or 20 years ago, it probably would have been entitled Vengeance and Humiliation. Uh, so we are making some progress. Um, I just want to say a word about myself and why I think I'm sitting here today. Um, I have been, uh, I, I, for whatever reason, uh, wanted to be a defense lawyer from the time that I was a child and uh, had that as my mission. Uh, and fortunately, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to be able to attend uh, a school, NYU, which had one of the first criminal defense clinics in the country, if not the first, probably right up there with Georgetown. Uh, and so I have done this my entire career uh, until I went to NACDL as its executive director. Um, I have seen firsthand the rise of mass incarceration. I have seen the advent of sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums, the evisceration of judicial power, and the rise of almost a completely unfettered prosecutorial power. Uh, I have seen the rise of the trial penalty, the decline of trials, uh, and a system, uh, most people refer to it as plea bargaining, but I always refer to it as plea begging, because that's what it's become. But most importantly, and most relevant to this discussion, what I've seen is the rise of draconian sentencing. The, the, the cruel and inhumane uh, lengths of time that we lock people away. Uh, and it has been a source of great frustration for me, uh, having been in the well of the court and having been on the receiving end on behalf of clients of some of those sentences. Um, I ultimately uh, decided, uh, rather than to give up, to fight first through the mainstream bar here, where we took on a number of issues here in New York, uh, and then with this position at NACDL. Um, NACDL, I'm very proud to say, is an, is an organization of all kinds of criminal defense lawyers, from military, private, public defenders, you name it. Uh, it's the entire defense bar. And I'm particularly proud that its mission is not to enhance the role of defense lawyers or make defense lawyers uh, more successful in society, but rather to promote a more rational and humane criminal justice system. Uh, and we've done that by attacking many of the evils that I already discussed, uh, that I mentioned, that bothered me. But most importantly, recently, uh, is work that we've done on the back end uh, of this, which is so much uh, related to mercy uh, and dignity. Uh, in 2014, when the Obama administration announced that it wanted to uh, consider comm commuting the sentences of long-serving inmates, I, I, along with others, was part of the uh, organizing a project known as uh, CP or Clemency Project 2014. Um, it's important to understand why the project had to be organized. And this is, regardless of what happens with clemency going forward, we always have to remember that people who are in prison virtually have, no, have virtually no access to counsel. Um, if they had counsel, uh, and, and most assuredly they did have counsel during their case, that counsel almost universally is not permitted to do even post-conviction work, let alone clemency work. So if anybody is going to be able to put together an articulate peti petition, especially if it involves any legal analysis, we needed volunteers to do that. And I was proud that NACDL partnered with the ACLU, uh, the American Bar Association Criminal Justice uh, Section, uh, FAM and uh, federal defenders uh, to, to create one, one of the great pro bono projects of all time. You're going to hear from Professor Barco in a, in a little while about the problems with that program that Obama had, uh, the rigid criteria, the, the, the clunky process, uh, the prosecutorial uh, control of it, uh, and uh, sadly many were left behind uh, when it ended. But since we're at a law school, and one of our most important functions, I believe, as lawyers is to inspire the next generation of lawyers. I can't help but note with pride 
the, what that project did accomplish. We had 3,000 volunteer lawyers. They ended up screening 36,000 applications, submitted 2,500 petitions, and of the 1,716 that Obama granted, 894 came through the project, um, which involved over 300 life sentences. And based on the average life expectancy and other factors, we estimate that we saved 36,000 years of imprisonment and $430 million. <laughs> So uh, I'm now fortunate to be working with FAM. We have a state clemency project. We have 200 lawyers working in that. We've submitted, or at least within the next week or two, we will submit our 100th petition. Um, sadly, not many of them have been granted yet, but I'm still ever hopeful. Uh, and uh, we've come up with lots of thoughts about how perhaps uh, we can encourage the governor who actually invited this support uh, to do more. Um, it's so important, and I want to just say, as, be, as I move into the introduction of the panelists and turn this really over to them, that notwithstanding all of my years of practice, the one thing that I took away from my participation in clemency was in reviewing the cases, because I was involved also in doing the review and helping the lawyers who were on the front lines, it just never ceased to amaze me how much people were capable of change and how people who, who had literally no hope, no hope at all that they would ever see freedom, were doing good and productive things. How many people could be in a federal penitentiary and have no violations for 15 or 20 years? And I'm seeing that in the state cases as well. We, we cannot possibly have a system that doesn't understand and recognize that people can change. That's where mercy and dignity you know, have to be recognized. And any system that doesn't recognize that, in my opinion, is one that is, it, 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 if it purports to provide justice, it's nothing more than a sham. Um, anybody who has ever experienced life, anyone who has a teenager, anyone who has ever been a teenager, understands the concept of growth. Uh, and I often like to say I'm very blessed to have a wonderful son um, who's you know, now in his early 30s, but what he was at 15 and 16 was you know, a very, very, very different person. Um, so if we look at things from that perspective, we understand that these kinds of draconian approaches are cruel to the individual and the family, they waste resources, and they're bad social policy. So with that, um, I want to uh, describe the backgrounds of our two panelists and then turn it over to them. Uh, professor Rachel uh, Barkow, who is a vice dean at NYU and is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy, also the faculty director on the Center for the Administration uh, of Criminal Law, uh, is, is, one of, is, our, is one of our two panelists. Um, professor Barkow er earned her BA at Northwestern and her JD at Harvard. She served as a law clerk uh, to Judge Lawrence H. Silberman on the District Court of, uh, for DC and also as a law clerk to the to the late Supreme Court Justice uh, Antonin Scalia. She served for six years on the Sentencing Commission. She teaches criminal law, administrative law, and constitutional law. Among her many awards and honors, the one that I, of course, have to gravitate to is the Distinguished Teaching Award, because that's what we need more of, distinguished teachers. Um, and Professor Barco has published so many articles, I couldn't begin to describe them. But I want to specifically note, and, and this is coming from the heart, a book that came out just this year uh, called Prisoners of Politics, Breaking the Cycle of Mass Incarceration. This book is out there, and I am recommending it to you wholeheartedly. Um, this describes the flawed criminal justice system that I have experienced. It talks about how politics uh, have mindlessly, and in a mindless obsession with, with severity and limitations on discretion um, uh, for everybody except prosecutors, have led to mass incarceration, uh, wasted resources, and have not made us safer. Um, but more importantly than that, uh, Professor Barco describes a, a practical uh, regimen of solutions uh, that look at to institutional reform, including, most importantly, um, reliance on independent expertise, curtailing prosecutorial discretion by, Im by, by imbuing it, uh, some checks and balances, and a more robust role for the courts. Um, I am not kidding you. you should get, if you're serious about criminal justice reform, you need to get this book. Uh, and I have no vested interest. I'm not getting a percentage, I promise you. Um, but talking about a more robust role for courts, our second panelist uh, is a perfect example of that. Uh, District Court uh, Judge Leo Sorokin, 
um, has shown how a court can make a difference. He has served on the federal bench in Massachusetts since 2014. Prior to that, he was a U.S. magistrate and the chief U.S. magistrate, and before that, an assistant uh, federal uh, defender uh, for more than eight years uh, and served in the office of the Attorney General uh, of Massachusetts, including two years as assistant attorney general. He earned his B.A. at Yale, his J.D. right here at Columbia, uh, and Judge Sorokin is here to discuss mercy and dignity through the prism of an in innovative program uh, that he has established known as RISE. Uh, the program was started in 2015. It stands for Repair, Invest, Succeed, and Emerge. It is a post-plea, pre-sentence, intensive supervision pro project uh, program that is designed to promote rehabilitation, reduce recidivism, save money through a restorative justice model. Um, Judge Sorokin, I want to start with you. Uh, and before I invite you to describe RISE and hopefully get to the right uh, screen, uh, 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 slides, I, wanna, I want you to please explain why it is, how you came to have an interest in uh, alternatives to incarceration, specifically restorative justice, and how you reconcile that with the demand for public safety. So in terms of the public, um, in terms of the public safety question, I, I would give you two examples. Um, <clears throat> one is um, uh, somebody who was a client of mine when I was a public defender, who um, he went to, he had, before I represented him, he was charged and convicted in state court of robbing a restaurant and all of the patrons at gunpoint. And he served a lengthy s sentence in the maximum security state prison in Massachusetts. And um, when he got out, um, sh not that long after he got out, he was arrested and I was appointed to represent him. And what he did was rob a restaurant at gunpoint. Um, and the difference between the, what I represented him in and the prior crime was that he had, in theory, solved some of the problems that had led to his arrest the last time, um, a, a form of learned improvement. Um, so um, 12 years in state prison that probably cost Massachusetts in today's dollars between three and $600,000. And within a year, he was doing the same thing. So it was a pretty, from a public safety perspective, if I were the restaurant manager who had a gun put to my head that said, open the safe in 30 seconds or else, I would have been pretty unhappy with the outcome last time round. Because it didn't seem to me, if I were him, I wouldn't have thought that, that like I should have been sitting there at the end of that gun. And um, one answer to that is, well, somebody like him should have gotten life in prison. But in fact, through various turns and twists in federal sentencing law, after he was sentenced, years into sentence, he was released after like serving nine or 10 years of the federal sentence, and he hasn't reoffended, and he's doing fine. And it made, makes me think about, there are different ways to intervene. And the second example I'll give you is someone who's gone through the RISE program, and he was released on bail after he was charged with being a drug distributor, and he went to inpatient drug treatment, and what he would say to you, and he said this at a conference of US magistrate judges last year, he said, I was, I'm a I was a drug addict and a criminal. My father was a drug addict and a criminal, and my grandfather was a drug addict and a criminal, and I was following in a long family tradition. And I went to drug treatment, and I came out, I was sober, but I was a drug, I was the same guy, and I sold drugs, and that's just what I did. And there wasn't, there wasn't anything wrong with that, that's what I did, and people wanted drugs, I didn't really think there was any problem. I did drugs, I was a drug addict. And I didn't think anything of it, even though I was sober and gone through the inpatient drug treatment program. I signed up for RISE, which is the program that we started, and I just signed up for it because um, it was, seemed like something that could help. And then I had to go sit in a meeting, and I, a workshop, and that workshop was with a um, federal prosecutor was sitting next to me. And I thought, what's that guy doing here? And so um, that guy, fast forward now, that defendant, he has been sober and employed for years. He ended up not going to prison. And the most significant success is not what happened in his life. The most significant success is his son, when he was arrested, when the father was arrested, was on his way, in his father's words, of becoming like his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. And now, his son is the first in four generations to go to college. And he's doing well, and they have a relationship. And that 
is a success. And what those experiences taught me is that, that not that prison should never be used, but that there are different approaches and that there are human-centered approaches that, in fact, can make people safer and that we should um, embrace those approaches and restorative justice is one. So let me, with that, invite you to give a brief overview. So um, I would say then, I'm not gonna really talk about the RISE program. You've heard about front-end programs. We copied our program largely from the Eastern District of New York's program. And our front-end program is very similar to those programs. What's the innovation that we've brought to it? What I think is potentially transformative in the criminal justice system is the, re uh, the restorative justice part of our program, which is what I'm gonna talk about, which is required for anyone who wants to do this program. And so what is important to think about is, first of all, what is restorative justice? And restorative justice is really a theory of justice. It's a different kind of theory, it's a different approach, and you need to start thinking about things in that way, I think, and when you're thinking about the criminal justice system. It's focused on a meaningful acceptance of responsibility, and making amends for the harm you committed. Now, I don't know anybody really who thinks it's a bad idea to make amends for wrongs you've committed. It's pretty much what I tried to teach my children. It's what I think most people think, but it's something that at times we get away from in the criminal justice system. So that's an important part of restorative justice. The second thing that is really significant to think about by restorative justice is the fifth word there, fourth word, I can't see, process. It's a process. Restorative justice is not, and, and that's one thing that's very different. Sentencing in the, in the federal system is a moment in time. It's when we, the word is we impose sentence on you, and that imposition happens in one moment. There might be a hearing that could be 10 minutes, it could be two hours, but it's, then you impose sentence in a moment. And restorative justice is a process, and it takes time, but um, so doesn't serving a long prison sentence. So, do you want to keep going? Or? Yeah, we are. well I was just gonna interject just sure. to, if you, I'd like to invite you to explain exactly what happens. This is essentially a deferral of the sentence, right? So what our RISE program, you plead guilty, and we put off sentencing for a year, and you're gonna go through drug treatment and various other things, but you're gonna go through restorative justice. And some of the things that restorative justice is gonna make you do is think about different kinds of questions. Like, what is the harm? Who's responsible and what repairs are we going to undertake? Those are meaningful questions that most people, most human beings I submit to are thinking about when there's been a crime. When they're a victim of a crime, when they're a bystander to a crime, they're thinking about questions like that. Those are not always questions that we ask at a regular sentencing. And I think that there are meaningful questions to be asked. And the process that we're going to take people through is going to involve um, uh, a number of things, repairing, um, encountering harm, and thinking about it, and transformation, hopefully, of the, of the person and the defendant involved. And you might say, well, how do you do that? That all sounds great. So there's four parts in RISE to our restorative justice program. Part one is required. It's a one-on-one -on -one meeting with our probation officer who's trained in, in these practices, and it explains the process and gets the defendant ready. Part two is a two-day, all-day workshop with anywhere from three to eight defendants who are participating in RISE. It's co-led by a probation officer and typically a, a one of several moms whose sons were murdered in Boston in the drug trade, who all give their time and want to do this work, and then several other members of the community. And the purpose of that two-day required workshop. That's where the guy I was telling you about sat next to a federal prosecutor and sat down and said, what am I doing here and who's this guy and why is he here? But a half hour later, he was talking to him because the, the point is to focus on harm and accountability and, that, and you'll see in some quotes that I show you later, it, it gets people to think about things in a very different way. There are a lot of people who, in my experience, appear before me who don't think they did anything wrong even though they pled guilty, like they were selling drugs. They think that's just okay. That's what people do. And they don't really think about what it really means. So that part is required. The next two parts are not required. It's voluntary, and that's intentional. The first parts are required because people wouldn't do it if we didn't require it. The last two parts are voluntary because it can't be meaningful unless it's voluntary. And those parts are 
individual readings and reflections to get them to think more about it, and then a one-on-one -on -one apology if they wish to make an apology or some other individual effort to make a restoration. So that's how we do it. Um, it is time consuming. Um, there are, this is a pretty standard, a sort of circle workshop for two days is a pretty standard kind of piece of restorative justice. But there are different ways you could construct this program. For those of you in the federal system, I'll tell you my little pitch, we're writing a manual that we hope to have done with this summer to give to people so that it's like a equivalent to like the bench book. Let, so me, let me interject. Yep. I, know you, I know you want to show some of the quotes, but I want to ask you something. So is it, does the judge then, the sentencing judge, get a report on how the person did? So, no. So the sentencing judge gets a report about how they did in RISE. Did they do their drug treatment? Did they get a job? We set objectives at the beginning. All of that they get a report on. The restorative justice, the first part, that's required, they just get a report, you did it or you didn't do it. You're not great, you have to go, you're not graded on your performance in the workshop. The last two parts, they would. So you might hear about, if they, for example, they might, um, one person was selling drugs and he went to meet with, um, he went to apologize to the mother of a friend of his who died of a drug overdose. And he went and met with her and explained what happened and explain how he felt responsible for certain things. So that mom gave feedback, and that feedback would be reported to and the judge. Then, so by virtue of deferring the sentence, giving the person the opportunity, or requiring them to go through the first part, giving them the opportunity to the other parts, you as the judge get to hear a very different picture, and that then can result in a better sentence. Certainly a different sentence, yes. So typically what we found is that people who go through the program and who complete their there isn't a per se graduation, but people who do this and seem to do well get lesser, unsurprisingly, get le lower sentences, often probation, than they would have otherwise received. And what's significant about it, I think the most significant thing about it, is that we're focusing people in the restorative justice piece on making real change in their lives and taking real, it's not just about the defendant, it's about the harm they cause and about repairing that. So the most persuasive letter I've ever received at a sentencing on behalf of a defendant was from his mother-in-law. And most people probably wouldn't lead with their mother-in-law at sentencing. No, but, a, but a letter from the mother-in-law is very powerful. Right, but what the mother-in-law says, I didn't want my daughter to get involved with this guy. He was no good. And I read his PSR, and she was right. He was, he had a, he had, seven separate entries on his criminal record between 18 and 30, um, including uh, burglaries. He was a drug addict. He, wasn't, he was involved in a federal drug conspiracy. But you know what? The reason she wrote the letter was she said she was cautiously optimistic. And the reason she was cautiously optimistic was because he was taking responsibility for what he did. He was making amends. He was paying his child support. He was treating his daughter right. He was taking responsibility for his life, not just for himself, but how he treated other people. Did you have any difficulty getting buy-in either from the U.S. Attorney's Office or from your colleagues? No, actually we had some back and forth with both the U.S. Attorney's Office and the defenders about creating RISE, and they had various, each side had some issues about the RISE program in different way, procedural ways. Nobody really had a lot of questions about the restorative justice piece, and I think that's honestly in part because I'm not sure a lot of people really knew a lot about it, and so they, they didn't, they, the defenders had a few questions in terms of, um, you know, would people be questioned about prior criminal behavior or something? But other than that, there wasn't. And what we have found now is that, that as people have gotten exposed to it and learned more about it, there's a lot of enthusiasm among the judges. We have individual judges who have now started saying, to, at sentencing, we want you to participate in this restorative justice part of the program, even if you're not in RISE. And we're now looking to expand our capacity to do that. So this was all done, though, on an ad hoc basis, correct? I don't know what you what mean I by that. What I mean by that is there is no a formal rule. There's no specific enabling legislation. That right. There's no, correct. There's no statute that I know of or rule of criminal procedure. What we did was we, we um, in terms of RISE, we wrote, it's essentially like a standing order of the court or governing memo that governs the procedural aspects of RISE and how that's worked. And the restorative justice is just something you do as a component of that. This is a total curveball, so I apologize to you yep. and to the audience. 
Do you have any concerns, and I would you know, I invite Professor Barker also, is there something potentially a fundamentally unfair or some equal protection issues in the fact that in certain districts you don't have this opportunity, whereas in your district you do? I mean, I think it's a great idea, but I mean, this is an example of courts sort of uh, diving so into no. trying to so fix the system. So I was in this classroom when I went to law school, and I took con law in this classroom, and one of the cases that I remember was Williams v. Lee Optical, which was a Supreme <laughs> Court decision from, I think, the 1930s. And, um, and the, what I remember from that case, I haven't read it in a long time, was that it said that the government was entitled to move one step at a time. And so we are moving one step at a time. We have created first this program in our district for not even everybody in our district. It's only available to the people in RISE. We're now looking to expand our infrastructure. I don't think that it's a, an equal protection violation that before we made it available to everybody, we did it in one place. And I do think that, uh, that it would obviously take a lot more initiative, but a, a defendant in our district or in another district who wasn't in RISE could do something like this. This is like the, the idea of, making, of taking responsibility for what you've done and making amends for it is not new. And so um, I think you could it could do it. And, and I think those of you read the New York Times, there was an article a couple of years ago about a murder in uh, Florida where a family um, went to the prosecutor in Florida and they didn't want the defendant released or not prosecuted for the murder of their daughter, but they didn't want the death penalty and they participated in a restorative justice process. So I, I can't help but, but observe uh, as somebody who likes to tie all the loose ends together at these conferences that I, I know one of the focuses yesterday was on the importance of pretrial release and this is a program where you can't get into it unless you're released, but it does, I'm, I'm correct about that, right? Yes. So this just is another illustration of why we need to deal with that on the front end, because these opportunities for people between the time of their arrest and the ultimate disposition of the case to, to change themselves, to, to, to make an effort to, to come to a better place uh, are simply not there if you don't give people that opportunity. Uh, I want to, if there's, if there's a particular quote or something, I want to give you that chance, so, uh, and then I want sure. to shift to One last thing Barco. I'd say, I'm, I'll put up, I put up one quote you can look at. There are some others which I can provide to the Allah Foundation to circulate in the materials, the slides, if you want. The last thing I'd leave you with is something that Norman said, which is about choice. So one of the things that I think is really significant is giving people the chance to make a good choice and and giving people the hope and the opportunity to execute that choice in a, in a positive way. So I, I, you, this is an example and of giving people a choice and an opportunity. And you point out that people in, in pre, who don't get released don't get the opportunity, and that's something in the sort of one step at a time we're thinking about and how to make it available. It's a lot harder to do in custody, but um, we're looking to do that next. But I think that, that's, that if you think about giving people at every turn the opportunity to make a good choice and giving them the hope and the opportunity and the tools to do that. Many people will make a good choice, and that can lead in all sorts of different places to positive outcomes. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, as we shift the, the discussion now, I, you know, when I, we talk about dignity, I have always felt that, um, and mercy, uh, the founders of the country really understood that. Uh, they were imperfect in many ways, but they did understand the importance of dignity and mercy. I've always felt that dignity is, is, is inherent in the Sixth Amendment uh, in saying uh, that everyone, uh, all accused persons, have the right to counsel. Uh, they didn't say all accused innocent people or all accused may be innocent or may be guilty. Uh, they included guilty people because they understood the dignity of the individual um, and similarly, they understood the importance of mercy. Um, in Federalist 74, Hamilton wrote, the benign prerogative of pardoning should be uh, as little as possible fettered or embarrassed. It's a little uh, stilted language nowadays, um, but as you have written, uh, uh, Professor Barco, the clemency power sits right there in Article II, right alongside uh, the power of the, uh, the president to be the commander in chief of the armed forces. Uh, and so the, the, it seems pretty clear that the founders recognized that even though somebody may break the law, they may still be entitled to, uh, uh, to mercy. Um, so I guess I'd like to ask you, um, how, do, how has the power fared over the years? Uh, and if it hasn't fared so well, why not? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, just this, I guess this will be the quick history of clemency at the federal level, um, but some of this will mirror what you would see at the state level as well, which, which is that you did see fairly um, steady and decent amounts of clemency grants in the early history of the United States by presidents and also governors. And really, that continued uh, throughout the nation's early history. Uh, you know, so there's stories of people coming and visiting President Lincoln, and he would give commutations and pardons right there. Um, what you, when you see the kind of first big shift in clemency grants, both at the state and the federal level, is really the advent of parole. Uh, because then what you have is a different mechanism that you could use to take a look at somebody's sentence later on down the process. So you still have clemency, it still sits alongside parole, but you see the clemency numbers start to, to dip with the advent of parole. But the real drop, the kind of real precipitous decline is the same period of time that we see the rise in mass incarceration. So, you know, you really start to see 1980 and thereafter. It's kind of an, a, a huge anomaly in the fact that you have, uh, you, you have a decline with parole, but then you have mandatory minimums. You have Supreme Court jurisprudence, which basically says that no jail sentence is ever too long. And it seems like it's created a situation where uh, the, the, the founding notion is, is has withered. Yeah, it's a horrible combination of factors because when Congress got rid of parole at the federal level and created incentives for states to get rid of it as well, there wasn't much thought, I don't think, you know, you can look through the legislative history, you won't really find it, about, well, should we then have to reinvigorate our clemency process mm -hmm. to pick up the slack for this tool that we're now getting rid of. Um, you don't really see that because I think there just wasn't a lot of attention to the idea that people can change. In fact, it was just the opposite. It was really a sensibility at the time that rehabilitation wasn't working. Um, and if rehabilitation wasn't working, why look again at somebody and how they were doing later on? Um, so, you know, a really pessimistic take on the human condition, um, but also a really unrealistic one in terms of how people evolve and change over time. So you end up with the end of parole in many places, including at the federal level. Um, you still have clemency as an option, but it really gets reduced in terms of the actual grants of clemency. And the reason for that is it's the same force in both instances, which is this kind of tough on crime political environment makes it both difficult for somebody who's in an elected office to give a commutation or a pardon um, for fear that they're going to be uh, facing a, a kind of Willie Horton effect. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, um, in the presidential campaign between George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis, there was the ad about Willie Horton had gone out on a weekend furlough while Michael Dukakis was governor and had committed, you know, a really horrible, violent offense. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, you know, this is what you'd be getting if you elected him as president. And he, and certainly many people in the country, viewed that ad as pivotal in his, in his loss. And so the takeaway from that was no other elected politician wanted their own Willie Horton. Right. And it created an environment that made it really hard to give clemency grants. And then, and to, and to keep the political balance in this election, Bill Clinton, during the campaign, went back to Arkansas to uh, oversee the uh, execution of someone of limited means. Yes, Mental. so someone with you know intellectual disabilities yeah. and nevertheless went back to sign the death warrant. So that politics, it's true of Democrats and Republicans alike, this would be a bipartisan kind of problem um, in terms of clemency declinations. So I'd like to invite you to uh, give us a little bit more of the, of the, of the numbers and, the, and, and, and some of the flaws in the process as you see it. Yeah, so this is in the news now. Um, um, in a different way than it was before when I used to give this talk, uh, which was all about the Obama initiative and things that President Obama had done right and had done wrong. Um, now we have a new kind of clemency regime that didn't look quite like, so I don't, do not have a Kim Kardashian slide, um, but I will tell you a little bit about what clemency looks like under the current administration. So I would say the takeaway from the end of both of these is this remains a fundamentally flawed process. Um, and it, it really has, uh, the president has under the Constitution unbelievably broad authority to give people commutations and pardons. So you could have a president really using that authority for good, and I think necessary good, because we don't have other uh, valid second look mechanisms in the federal system. You can't get parole. Um, so unless you can kind of eke by with compassionate release, which has been very stingy, although I know people are going to try to broaden that, and I applaud that effort, um, this is it. This is your mechanism. So it's kind of a weird mm -hmm. setup that if you are one of the you know 200,000 or so people incarcerated in the federal system, you need to get the president uh, to give you sentence 
sentencing relief. And if you're somebody who's out there with a federal conviction on your record that you would like to, to remove, we don't have an expungement process for that at the federal level. You also need to go to the President of the United States. So I mean, it's really crazy when you stop to think about it. That is somebody who, at least under normal times, is a busy person um, doing official business. And so the idea that you could go in there and get clemency is really kind of preposterous. So um, the, there is a process, though, that uh, has been put in place for giving clemency at the federal system. Um, which is its own bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, you're supposed to go through several stages if you wanted to get clemency. And this isn't an ordinary course. Um, so this is going to be different than some of the commutations uh, and pardons you may have seen on the news recently that uh, President Trump has given. They did not go through this process. But in the normal course of things, what would happen is you would file a petition with the Office of the Pardon Attorney in the Department of Justice. Um, and then if that pardon attorney thought your case looked uh, like it had something to it, it would then go up to the pardon attorney. Uh, then it would go into the office of the deputy attorney general uh, to a lawyer there, uh, and then to the deputy attorney general. Uh, but the key is, is you, you have to make it through each one of those hoops to get to the next level. And all of this is taking place in the Department of Justice, which is the very agency that brought your case. And when they go through your petition to decide whether or not they think it should be granted, one of the very first things they do is they go to the original office that prosecuted your case, and they say, hey, what do you think, prosecutor? who brought the case initially. In, in, right. In fact, if the, if the prosecutor is still there, they go to the actual prosecutor. The actual person. And so it would really defy everything we know about human cognition and our ability to kind of second guess ourselves to imagine that when that happens, the prosecutor says, gee, you know, maybe I should take another look at that case that I tried and put my heart and soul into, or the fact that I put this person in prison was, could I have been wrong? That is typically not what happens. You get a pretty fast no um, in response to those requests about what would happen. And mind you, that prosecutor has not, uh, there's no indication they've been kind of brought up to speed on what's happened to this person since they've right. been sent. The last time they saw the case was at sentencing. So they have no idea what's taken place since then. Um, any kind of rehabilitation, the kinds of programs they might have participated while incarcerated, it's just their view of the case initially. And if they say no, you know, that is usually the end of it. Um, and then the other kind of key, key thing to keep in mind about this process is you can see that before it'll ever go to the White House, it has to get through the Deputy Attorney General. That's the person in the Department of Justice who is essentially in charge of all criminal prosecutors. So that person is working on a daily basis with prosecutors in the United States for law enforcement purposes. And so, again, another very busy person for whom clemency is not typically at the top of the agenda uh, for them and their other priorities. And it's usually not the reason they want the job. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that gets put on the back burner. And they really tend to be prone to agree with the prosecutors in their office as opposed to kind of looking at these cases anew. So this is a tough, tough climb. And if you somehow make it through the DOJ gauntlet, then you'd make your way over to the White House. And by the way, this was all done with paper files. This wasn't even computerized, so it would be an actual file moving its way through. Um, then you'd go to the White House Counsel's Office. Again, an office that has a lot of things going on. It could have a Supreme Court, a Supreme Court appointment at the time. Um, all the other things you can imagine a White House Counsel's right. Office is mm -hmm. doing, um, you know, during this administration, it would have been everything associated right. with the investigation, you know, it's a busy place. Um, and then you would have to somehow get the White House counsel to also agree that this should be a grant. And then... If I could just, and if I could just jump in yeah. before you get to that last, uh, the, the last <laughs> the hurdle. The suspense. Just, be, just yeah. because I can't leave the third branch out. Um, it, also in this process is they go back to the original sentencing judge, which in some cases could be helpful, but in many cases... Yep. Well, you can speak to it, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, you're really kind of, it's really putting a lot of weight on what happened a long time ago. You know, you're really kind of getting the feedback from people that saw this case before, but given everything we've talked about today about how people change, the ways in which they evolve, that's really not given primacy in this inquiry. Um, and so it doesn't end up really being a process that's geared toward thinking about how people evolve and change. It's really about protecting an initial decision. Um, and so it's really no surprise that that we're going to see very low grant rates um, for clemency. So this gives you a historical overview of what those grades have looked like over time. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting is you can see, so first of all, um, you can see that things really start to kind of take a nosedive 
after the Ford grants. You know, you kind of have a steady clip of grants early on. Um, then a big spike under President Ford, which was a program he initiated for people who um, had dodged the Vietnam draft um, to give a mass clemency for those folks. So that's why that number spikes. And that was a limited term project but yes. with an interesting model, right? Yeah, an interesting model that I think we might learn from if we wanted to kind of do more mass clemencies. Um, he created kind of a blue ribbon commission that advised him on how to handle those those cases, and they were able to very quickly process, you know, thousands, as you can see, 14,000 of these cases. Um, but after that, you can see it's almost hard to see the grants um, after that. And, and you can see there at the very end, it looks like things, um, w the Obama initiative, which gets a lot of accolades, um, and, and, you know, I certainly applaud what President Obama did, but I think when you see it in this perspective, you realize, you know, it was something, but it wasn't actually that big of a program that the president ultimately initiated. And in fact, what's really amazing about what happened there is his denials. Um, because you can see the thousands upon thousands of people that were denied by President Obama. Um, this gives you some more data on that, uh, which shows you the total grant rate by President um, and also divides it by pardons and commutations. And so just to give you the refresher on that, a commutation would be the sentence reduction for someone who's currently serving time so they could get out earlier. And the pardon would be um, you know, essentially the expungement of the conviction from somebody's record. Um, pardons in the federal system, uh, if we follow typical Department of Justice rules, you'd have to wait for several years after you had been released from prison to even apply for a pardon. So you'd show you'd had five years of no infractions of any kind, and then you would apply for your pardon. Um, and so what you can see here is that the numbers of the of pardons, um, you know, go from a 51% a pardon rate under President Nixon, you know, the kind of steady decline that continues through President Obama, um, and then the commutation rate, again, you know, you kind of still are hovering at 7% with Nixon, um, and then it just goes lower and lower, and even though President Obama had this big initiative, still gears this thing up as much as possible, still only gets to 5%, uh, which is a rate that is not even as high as the rate that we saw with President Nixon. So, um, so I would say modest, modest program on the part of, uh, of President Obama. Um, why might that be? Okay, so here's a few reasons why uh, it wasn't that big of, a, of, of an initiative. So one is that process that I told you about, which is it's just very hard to run the gauntlet through that whole DOJ process. But the other reason is there were the criteria for getting clemency in the Obama initiative was basically you couldn't have any violence of any kind in your background. No matter how much you had changed or what had taken place, it could have been 20 years ago that you had that. Um, it wouldn't matter under the criteria that they set out. Um, and then the other uh, key thing about the Obama initiative is they really only wanted to target people who would get different sentences by law today. So it was a way of dealing with the fact that if Congress had made changes or after the sentencing guidelines became advisory, um, <laughs> If those things, because those things weren't retroactive, the idea was you could use clemency as a kind of retroactive relief tool, um, but it wasn't actually changing things all that much because this is going to be pretty modest. And I, I want to just jump in and say I can't underscore enough how irrational it was to exclude people if they had any history of violence because, first of all, violence is not necessarily actual violence. It could be a it could be a crime that didn't involve anybody being hurt. It could have been a crime that somebody committed when they were 18 years old and they've been in prison for 25 years. It was, from my perspective, um, in, in, the, in trying to administer what we were doing and find people that qualified, literally heartbreaking uh, to have to say, well, this person is not going to make it because they did something 20 years ago. Yeah, and they were ruling people people out even if it was just an arrest for violence. So particularly worse. if it was an arrest for domestic violence, that was a deal breaker through their internal process, even if no conviction had resulted. So, um, so it was a pretty miserly set of criteria. And so it's not as surprising when you start to look at uh, the final results that you end up with... Um, fewer grants than you might have initially expected. So you can see the ultimate grant total, which we've already talked about, is 1,716. Um, 
What's interesting about that is the Sentencing Commission uh, ran a report basically evaluating those criteria I had put up before to try to ballpark how many people likely met those criteria, the no violence, um, no significant criminal history, and even using really conservative estimates, um, so really interpreting those criteria to be very strict. The Sentencing Commission thought there should have been 2,687 people who got clemency under this initiative, um, and in fact, when then the commission analyzed who did get it, they found that only 92 of these 1,716 actually met all the criteria. So somewhere along the line, um, we had these 2,600 people who did meet the criteria not getting their grant. Um, and then you get people who did get the grant, uh, but they didn't quite meet the criteria. Many of those were life sentences, and I'm not saying they shouldn't have gotten them, um, just that uh, it ended up being a process that started to kind of miss at least the target that they had initially set out. Um, so here, just another way for you to see all the denials. Um, also, another way for you to show the process being flawed was in how it was all compressed at the end. 89% of the grants took place in the last 10 months um, and 31% in the last month. Um, so it all got rushed at the end. All right, one uh, quick overview Please. of today, where yeah. we are today. Um, so here, uh, no graphs. Uh, I don't even know how to graph it. I couldn't even decide where to begin. Um, so I thought I'd just give you the list. Um, so these are the folks who have gotten their pardon so far uh, from President Trump. One thing he's doing that I think is noteworthy is he's already using this power. We have not seen that in a while, a president coming into office and using it right away. Usually it's the kind of thing that happens at the end of a term. And if it's a president running for re-election, it comes after they've either learned that they're not going to serve a second term or if they are, they push it all the way back to the end of the second term. So President Trump, interestingly, is going out and using this now. He seems to like this power. Um, he is using it in a variety of instances. These are all the cases of pardons, and you can see um, there's not a whole lot of common denominators among these folks other than um, they either know the president or they know other people who are politically connected um, such that they have been able to kind of catch his eye and then similarly, um, the commutation, so we have three. Um, again, uh, these are a little different though. Unlike the pardons, you know, these, these fall, I would say, are sending a somewhat different signal about not necessarily being people who are um, politically connected, although um, they, you know, they, these folks did use the connections that they had to try to make their way through. So Alice uh, Johnson, for example, um, was the person that Kim Kardashian had hoped mm -hmm. um, the president would give a commutation to. Um, so hard to discern a pattern other than so far it appears that it matters. So we kind of went from this hyper process in the Obama administration where you had to go through all of these hoops and the CP14 process and then the Department of Justice process to this, which is no process whatsoever, um, <laughs> but is, and is working more quickly, but you know does send, in my, to my mind, the disturbing part about what's happening now is the message it seems to send is it's, it's who you know as opposed to, you know, Know, that we're really looking at something that depends on you know true mercy or flaws in the system that kind of thing um, what if I have one second sure. to, to yeah. say um, so I just wanted to throw out a few things that I think do apply to both president you know any president that I would say uh, are some things that we could do to fix it number one is this should not be in the Department of Justice I really no state does this no state says hey where should we put clemency hey how about we have our prosecutors do it um, I don't think anyone would think to do that it's a historical accident that we do it at the federal level so you know kind of mission one no more DOJ running the show um, the other thing I think would be really helpful in this area is to really start to ask if we could kind of bring this to a modern age where we have instead of it's who you know and whether you got on Fox News um, or kind of an ad hoc process set up by a president who realizes at the last minute that they're interested in this. Maybe it put in place a commission that actually does this steadily and regularly and can look at data and evidence and do it more consistently. And I, um, I don't want to uh, presume that you remember everything that you wrote, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but if you do remember this, it might be useful for you to talk about how, what the Ford Commission looked like in terms of its composition. Yeah, so the Ford Commission um, is an interesting model and was a commission. The idea was to have it be, you know, kind of bipartisan. Um, 
people of, of stature who could make these recommendations and could be respected because they had done it. And I do think that sets out a kind of blueprint that we could think about going forward of having people who understand rehabilitation, um, people who understand what it's like, you know, formerly incarcerated people who have been through the system, so would understand kind of the prison experience and could understand things on somebody's record, what would it mean to participate in programming, um, and, you know, kind of how much of an achievement would something be. You could have people who are experts in recidivism and criminology, and you could certainly have law enforcement on there too. It's just they wouldn't be in charge of the process the way that they are now. Um, and, and the only other thing I will say is in the federal system, again, if you want to clear somebody's record, so we talked about right. the front end ways in mm -hmm. which you give somebody a second chance and mercy, if you want to do it at the back end, you have to go through the President of the United States to get your record cleared. So the other thing would be creating a commission model to have the President have a resource to go to that says, hey, actually, help me figure yeah. out who does need their record cleared. Well, with, res with, with respect to that, I completely agree. I also happen to think, you know, we, we our system has evolved in so many ways. We didn't have collateral consequences 200 years ago. Uh, now we have thousands and thousands of them. The idea that there's no federal procedure for cleaning a, a record up is absolutely abhorrent to me. Um, but I would also like to say that if there is anybody in the room who by any stretch of the imagination has some good friends in the White House, um, I strongly suggest that you think about uh, Professor Barco's suggestion for how the process might be reformed. Uh, I think it's something that um, there might be tremendous uh, bipartisan or cross-partisan uh, support for. Um, I'd like to just, um, uh, before, I think I'm going to leave a couple of minutes for questions, but I want to just ask, aside from clemency, aside from restorative justice, um, if either one of you want to comment on this, should we be thinking, um, given the difficulty of dismantling the mandatory minimums, uh, given the, the problem, the structural problems that you've identified, Professor Barco, with the, the domination of a prosecutor, prosecutorial mindset, which so uh, afflicted Obama's efforts to reform uh, criminal justice, is there space for um, some kind of uh, reemergence of parole, or should we be thinking about second looks? What can we do besides clemency to, to, to put mercy back in the system? So I'll, I, I will just start by saying that I, I do think it's fundamentally strange to, not, to think you could make a decision about a human being and that you'll never revisit it for 20 years, 30 years. I mean, no one would live their life that way and decide, oh, it'd be a really good idea for me to make a decision today um, about how I'm going to treat the next 20, 30 years and never rethink it based on new information or new evidence, particularly if it's about a human being, which, you know, we know how much people evolve and change over time, especially with a population of people that often is committing crimes at a young age and is going to change dramatically. So to me, I think a second look would be the the, the normal presumption that you would have in your system. And the question is, what does it look like? And, right, and who would do it? And if, and, if, and if the second look were to begin, be able to go back to the court, would the judiciary be up in arms about the increased caseload? Uh -uh. <laughs> so I can't speak for all the judges, and I have no idea what the Judicial Conference would say or the Sentencing Commission. I imagine there would be deep concern among some people about the number of cases that would be coming back and the like. So the way I would think about it is this is two things. One is I think it's really important that um, one part of one aspect of mercy is how you treat the individual how you treat individual people. So I think a lot about how I treat every person who comes into my courtroom, whether they're the defendant, whether they're a lawyer, whether they're a witness, whether they're somebody in the somebody in the audience. And I think everybody the the first starting place is treating each person with respect. With Regarding a second look, I think that there's a lot of sense in my mind to a second look because the amount of res the kind and amount of response that, that the community, which is in a sense represented ultimately by the court, needs to make to an individual in response to what they've done depends by how they respond to that. And that response happens over time. And so having a se I would be comfortable with having a second look after a period of time subject to structure. But that is something, I think, that would require a rule or a statute. Undoubtedly. So I'd like to invite the audience. Uh, we started a little late. We're going to end just, I think, right on time, maybe a couple minutes late. Anybody have any questions or comments for these two amazing individuals? Right there. The concern I have with a second look, and I'm all for that, and I, I, I'm obviously here, and I'm a believer in, in a lot of what's been discussed, 
the concern I have regarding a second look is if indeed um, we don't do something collaboratively with the Bureau of Prisons to work on their cognitive behavioral treatments, their programs. Um, there are a number of programs that exist, but from my discussions with BOP representatives, those programs are not funded and people are not getting into those programs. So when we're talking about individuals that have cognitive issues, mental health issues, and drug substance use issues, uh, using the right terminology, um, us go, you know, us taking a second look and not having the BOP collaboratively working on trying to get these individuals help is, 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 a, is a problem. It's an excellent point, and it underscores the point that was made in the panel on First Step yesterday, the, the concerns that a lot of us have uh, that the funding uh, and the will is not there in the Bureau of Prisons. It's an excellent point. Uh, was there, I think there was another hand up there. Yes, please, ma'am. So in regard to the pardon process, I know that when we receive pardon notifications that as a federal probation officer, we're often asked to give input on somebody's adjustment to supervision. How much consideration is our recommendation for somebody's pardon taken into the determination that for the pardon process to move forward? So I should say, and I probably should have said at the outset, this is a black box decision making process that we are never given. Um, you just, if you have, a, you know, we had a clemency pop up center at, at NYU with many cases, you're never given an answer as to why someone was denied. So I only kind of knew about the prosecutor influence because you sort of heard that after you meetings at DOJ and whatnot. Um, but in terms of what actually influences their decision, who knows? Because when you're given a denial, you're just told no. And, and it was really hard to figure some of them out because we even had people who were in the same case, one yes, one no. There was a case of brothers, for example. One got it, one didn't. And for the life of us, we could not understand why some one was a yes and one was a no. So these were with the commutations, and I believe that's, the, that's true of pardons as well. You just, you're not given an answer, so I'm not sure exactly how much weight they place on each part of the information that they're getting. Well, I got the times up, but a distinguished individual here seems to want to oh. say something. Yes, no, it's <laughs> I'm looking behind me. Um, it's actually even worse than that because you have no idea what the prosecutors are saying to the DOJ. You have no idea. So you don't even know what to respond to to present the correct facts. And, I, you know, your idea of a commission, I guess my, my question for you is, do you think that commission should be comprised of lawyers, should be comprised of judges, former judges, should be comprised of ordinary citizens? What, what should be the makeup of that? I think it should be a mix. It, it, it definitely doesn't have to be all lawyers and really shouldn't be because it's, it's by and large not a legal determination. You know, I don't think that's, that is a key ingredient at all. Instead, I would say, you know, you definitely want people who understand rehabilitation and, and kind of um, adjustments to the community, you know, so social workers, people who understand mental health and, and treatment needs. I think formerly incarcerated people are really important to be on a body like this um, because they really understand all these things. You know, for political reasons, I think any president or governor who's going to set a commission like this, you know, should have law enforcement people on there for sure. Because even though they really could weigh in in other ways, I think they should be part of the decision making. Because then, when you say I gave this grant, you can say this was the consensus of all these people, including law enforcement. A and I think it would be good for those folks to be on the commission, anyways, and sort of really look at some of these cases from that perspective. So, with the right people, I think you could have that. But and former judges also could be excellent picks for something like this. Um, but I, I think the key is you need the combination of both the people who know something about what you're asking, but also what gives the person who needs to make the grant enough of a political cover that they'll actually do it, because this is a political process at the end of the day. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, for those comments. Thank you for that last question. And, and uh, I just wrap it up by saying when, when I was, when I was in, in law school some decades ago, I, I, I clerked for a uh, uh, a woman who was one of the first uh, of her gender to be a law professor, uh, and uh, I helped uh, research a book that she wrote, and in it she inscribed, make sure you contribute to the honor of the profession. Uh, and I would like to say that Judge Sorokin and Professor Barco, thank you for contributing to the honor of our profession uh, and for your work to advance mercy and dignity. Right back at you. <laughs>